Thank you for joining us today, Tanya, to talk about the crisis unfolding in Syria amidst the uh, civil war that's been raging since March 2011 after Bashar al-Assad's forces opened fire on protesters in the southern city of Daraa. The UN estimates over 100,000 people have died since the beginning of the crisis and over 2 million people have been displaced as a result. Um, and the United Nations began investigating a purported use of chemical weapons a week after uh, the incident on the 21st of August took place and after the Syrian government gave the United Nations the green light to do so. The resulting report was handed down on the 16th of September and deals with both the scale and the nature of the incident itself. Um, so you're here to offer us a little bit of clarity and some, um, some insight on the implications of that report. Um, so my first question would be, um, does the report itself actually give us any, any indication as to um, the scale and nature of, of the attack itself? Well, it does, Sarah, actually, and, and for the first time. Um, we know, now know, as a result of the investigation by independent experts, that um, a fairly large-scale chemical weapons attack was carried out in the Damascus suburb of Ghouta on the 21st of August. And uh, we know that hundreds of people died, including children. So this report is critically important because it ends the speculation about that. We now know for sure that a war crime has been committed, uh, and that's very important, that confirmation. Mm. So who was responsible for the attack? Well, that's one thing about the report, is it that the inspectors weren't actually, in their terms of reference, they weren't actually given the instructed to actually identify a perpetrator. They just, all they were there to do was to actually confirm whether an attack had happened and how it had happened. Mm. But if you actually read the detail of the report, as many experts now have, um, you can actually get a pretty clear steer on who was responsible. And I think there are three important points that we take from the report that do actually help us identify the culprit. And the first is that the types of rockets that were used in the attacks were the same kind that have been used extensively by the Assad regime, by the Assad forces in the Syrian civil war. The second point is that the sarin that was used was of very high quality even higher quality than the sarin that was used by the Iraq regime in the attacks on Halabja in 1988. And the third point is that the attacks were carried out in weather conditions that suggest that those who carried out the attacks knew what they were doing. I mean, this was, a, this was carried out by people who had knowledge of chemical weapons warfare. And so they, they undertook the attack in conditions where the sarin was to have maximum effect, which is what it did. Mm. Okay. So this all points to a government-led military attack. It's not an ad hoc attack. It's a government-led military attack. Um, and most expert analyses of that report that I have read so far point to that quite clearly. Mm. Um, so the United States and Russia uh, have been talking about bringing the chemical weapons under international control. Um, do you think that um, this would be an effective way to do so amidst other commentary that um, Obama has pulled back from his red line rhetoric and has been shown to be weak in this instance? Yeah, there have been a lot of questions about whether this is an appropriate response to such an appalling attack, um, which is um, unprecedented since like, this is the worst WMD attack this century. And so there are a lot of questions about whether a political solution is appropriate and whether this shows up the US in particular as weak, given what Obama said about chemical weapons use crossing a red line, which would then lead to US-led military force against the Assad regime. But I have to tell you that um, I actually, I, I, do, I do sympathize to some extent with those arguments. Um, because hundreds of, you know, we, we know for sure that tens of thousands of people have died in the civil war and it's been hard to sit and watch the events unfold while the international community has been unable to launch an effective response. So we can understand the frustration and we can understand why people think that the Obama administration looks weak, 
But at the same time, as somebody who studied the WMD regimes over a number of years and has studied the Iraq war and the events that led up to the Iraq war and since, I have to say that I think that this plan offers our best hope for a solution that could actually have wider, com wider positive consequences. But I think it's an important, an important um, step in the right direction, this plan. And I think we have to give it a go. Mm. Tanya, what are the chances of success in the US-Russia plan? And how will it look when it rolls out? Well, that's a good question, Sarah. It's, it's definitely a very ambitious plan. And nothing like it has ever been tried before um, in the arms control efforts over the years. So um, we'll, ha we'll have to see. But just to give you a, a broad idea of what's expected, uh, now the first step will be the Assad regime declaring its exact stockpiles of chemical agents, warheads and facilities. So the Assad regime within the next week has to provide an accurate uh, account of what its chemical weapons capabilities are. Um, then after that, um, Monitors from the OPCW, which is the Organization for the Pro Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, will be sent in to Damascus to verify that that report is actually accurate. Mm. And then there will have to be some um, effort to, to get the stockpiles that exist to a central repository where they can be monitored and then by this time next year, or by the, in fact earlier than this, by the middle of next year, those weapons and facilities are supposed to have been destroyed under OPCW um, control. Mm. So that's the plan in a nutshell. And it sounds quite straightforward, but it's, it's actually not. Why is that? Well, even though it has the agreement of the Assad regime, which is obviously fundamentally important, it's actually very, very complicated in practical terms as well as political terms. So in terms of the practicalities, Syria has one of the largest chemical weapons programs in the world. It's got chemical weapons spread across more than 45 sites. And getting those weapons all rounded up safely and into a, a place that can be safely monitored mm. under condition, conditions of civil war is going to be extremely challenging. And there's a lot of it there too, isn't there? There's a lot there. And uh, one of the big problems is that the inspectors and the monitors that we send in to do that and to be part of that process are going to be personally in danger. Mm. So there will need to be a peacekeeping force. We will need armed monitors, with armed guard rather, with the monitors. And that'll have to be agreed by the Security Council in a resolution that's being uh, discussed at the moment. So there are political as well as practical challenges involved. And underpinning all of the difficulties is the fact that the Assad regime is not known for being an easy regime to deal with. Over the years, on the WMD front, this is one of the, the bad guys, to put it to be frank about it. Even though they have signed up to um, or agreed to sign up to the Chemical Weapons Convention? That's right. I mean, let's face it, Syria is a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and was found to be cheating mm. on its commitments under that treaty and in fact still has a secret nuclear weapons program which is currently apparently not active but much of that program still exists. So we know that Assad, the Assad regime is not an easy one to work with. Mm. And so there's all of those questions compounding the whole plan. So Tanya, this sounds like a long shot. Is it really going to be worth it? Well, I can understand why you'd ask that question because um, the challenges really are huge. I mean, there are massive obstacles in the way of the successful implementation of this plan. But let's look at what would happen if it succeeds. If this plan succeeds, it could actually open the door to broader peace talks in Geneva and give those talks a better chance of success. And that would be a win-win situation for everybody. There's going to have to be a political compromise at some point between the different sides involved in this conflict. And I think this at least will give us a nudge in that direction. So I think it's worth it on that level. At the level of the international community, it's also worth it mm. because this is an ambitious plan. It would strengthen the Chemical Weapons Convention 
and the WMD regimes in general in terms of precedent setting. And I think one of the important things is it would put pressure on those states that remain outside the Capital Chemical Weapons Convention to join. So we now know that Assad is going to join, but there are four really important states that remain outside the convention. That's Angola, Egypt, North Korea, and Somalia. It's really important that we get those states into that convention and get them to ratify it and implement it and give up their chemical weapon stockpiles. There are also two states that have signed the convention but never ratified it. That's Israel and Myanmar. And we'd also like to see them come into the regime. Mm. And I guess that would ensure success um, in some respects, but um, what would failure look like in the plan um, that Russia and the United States have been talking about? Uh, I know that there have been some commentators in Canberra that have been drawing parallels between Iraq and the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq or purported weapons of mass destruction and um, the movements in Syria to try and close down proliferation and use. Um, what, what do you think about those kind of parallels and um, do you think that there's any credibility in them? Well, that's a, that's a huge question and I can understand why people are drawing those parallels. I mean, there are important parallels, um, but there are also very important differences. And I think one of them is that the Assad regime has been caught red-handed here which was not the same in Iraq. Mm. Also, the evidence is clear in this case. That was not the case in Iraq. In this case, we have consensus among the permanent members of the Security Council and more widely in the international community that this has to be addressed urgently. We still have some differences over how it should be addressed, but we have consensus that it's urgently needing to be addressed. So that really does make it quite different. We've got this sense of urgency and we've got some momentum and that should hopefully carry us through. At the same time, um, you've asked what happens if it fails? What happens if that disarmament plan fails for whatever reason? Most likely that the Assad regime doesn't fully cooperate. Well, under those circumstances, I think we do get into a, a very difficult situation that could possibly be similar to the Iraq situation. In what way? Well, what we've got is we've got, um, we've got countries on one side that would like to see serious consequences in response to a failure of the Assad regime to like fully cooperate. Yeah, like forceful punishment, the use of military force as a punishment for the, um, for the chemical weapons use and the failure to comply. Um, on the other side, really, at the forefront, you've got Russia, which is an important Syrian ally, which has stated categorically that it does not want to um, allow the use of force against the Syrian regime. And in actual fact, doesn't seem to uh, uh, really envisage any circumstances under which it would see the use of force as appropriate against Syria. Not even targeted strikes which have been spoken about? Possibly previously. not even, I mean, not even targeted strikes as far as we know so far. It doesn't seem to be movable on that. And there are others out there, in fact, plenty of expert analysts out there that question what the impact would be of targeted strikes anyway in terms of, you know, what use it would serve. Mm. Um, there's a very complicated situation on the ground in Syria. We've got a deeply divided opposition um, included some, including some jihadist elements within that opposition. Mm. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any good outcome of, the use, of intervening militarily in the conflict, and it does seem that we do need to push for a political solution. Mm. So it's very, it's very tricky. If the plan doesn't fail, we are in a very tricky situation, and you could compare it to the situation perhaps that the US and its allies found themselves in in 2003, where they couldn't pursue the UN route because it was blocked primarily by France, which mm. stated very clearly that it would not support a Chapter 7 resolution that would authorise the use of force against Iraq. So we might find ourselves in a situation where Russia blocks the use of force and then the Obama administration we really would find itself in, in a very sticky situation. But what I'm hoping is that there's enough momentum, momentum behind the current plan um, that, and that everyone will see that it's in everybody's interests. Everybody's interests. It's a win-win for, win for everybody if mm. this is successful. 
um, hoping that's going to be enough to carry it through so that we don't find ourselves in a, in a repeat of the lead up to war in Iraq. Okay, so we've spoken about the implications for the international community in um, rolling out a, any kind of, of solution that um, the United States and Russia may come to um, in the United Nations Security Council. Um, but does the disarmament plan have any special significance for Australia? Um, does it affect us directly? Um, we've got a new Liberal government um, that's just been elected after six years of, of Labor leadership. Um, and our new Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, has uh, not really indicated that he has a particular interest in um, the international community and what it, what it might be able to do, uh, both for Australia, but also in the case of the Syrian crisis. Um, do you think that his government will follow a multilateralist outlook? Well, it's interesting you should say that, Sarah, and I think you're right in the sense that I do think that the Abbott government's foreign policy will focus on events closer to home and what Australia can achieve closer to home. But I think also the Abbott government will be well aware that Australia has played a leadership role in the WMD regimes, including a leadership role within the Chemical Weapons Convention and the Australia Group, which Australia launched. And uh, for that reason, I think that actually he will be drawn into, into this um, situation and want to, Australia to play a, f a very strong role um, in helping to resolve it. Um, there's also the point that the Abbott government has actually inherited a seat on the Security Council mm. from the Labour government. And in fact, this month, Australia is chairing the Security Council. So in actual fact, Australia has a very direct interest in the negotiations that are going on at the moment about the resolution that's being negotiated. Gary Quinlan, who's our ambassador to the UN, is chairing those meetings. Mm. So yes, Australia has a very direct, very direct involvement in this crisis now and uh, will want to see that it's resolved. And apart from anything else, Australia will want to make sure that the norm against use of chemical weapons remains strong. Nobody wants to see that eroded. And I think Australia will push it very hard, even though most of the Abbott government's focus will probably be on bilateral relations closer to home. I can see it taking a very strong and proactive role on this issue. And actually, if you look at what Julie Bishop, the new Australian foreign minister, has said in the last week or two, she has said she strongly supports the US-Russia disarmament plan. And she has also indicated that if that fails, she would support US military strikes. Thank you very much, Tana, for your time here. It's been very illuminating. Thanks, Sarah.